So today we're going to talk about how objects are perceived. We saw that the signal went from um, the uh, uh, from the eye to the uh, through the lateral genetic nucleus to V1. Well, today we'll we'll see where it goes from from that point. And one of the places it goes to is these other things around V1. So this is V2. From V1 it goes to V2. And from V2 it goes to V3. Uh, and if you want to look at it, um, this, is, this is the the cortex of a student whose name I forget now that I took some years ago. And you can see here that cortex, if I rotate it around, you see very little of of V1, almost nothing uh, pr from this point of view. But as it moves around, you can see it's tucked in, and but largely buried in this, in this calcarine sulcus. And then around it, like a, surrounding it like a, a ring, is these other two areas. Okay, and if we blow it up as we did last week, uh, you can see v, V1 in the middle there, here. Um, and you can see that this line here moves when it's at the horizontal, it's at the calcrine. We'll put it there. I stopped it just below the, the, the calcrine. So you can see here, the dotted line is the calcrine, and just the, because this is just below the calcrine, this line appears just above the calcrine. But you see also that this line appears at this far edge of V2 and at this near edge of V3. If it goes for a minute, uh, a frame or two longer, you can see the two lines of the V2, V3 border sort of combine to each other. And then the pat uh, sort of an interesting pattern of these lines are moving in opposite directions. This line is moving towards V2, V1, and this line is moving to the farther side of V3. So let's just look at it again. This is the where the horizontal line appears uh, in V1, and again at the border of V2, V3, whereas a vertical line appears here at the far end. It's, it's vertical, so it's above the calcrine and at the very far edge of V1, but again at the near edge of V2 and at, at the far edge of V3. So there's a neat pattern appearing. Why is that? Well, um, what, what's happening is that uh, these two things are defining these borders and uh, uh, or where, where V1 and V2, V3 are. Um, and neuroscientists have used the showing a subject where the horizontal line is and where the vertical line is to define in each, in each subject where these um, areas lie. Now this funny pattern is explained by the, the following. You can see here is a line, sort of crooked, um, uh, going this way. From the horizontal to the vertical. Okay, So it's going from almost at the calcarine. You can see it's at almost at the calcarine. And then going to the V2 border. Again, th this line is re repeated, and its representation starts with the arrow just beside it, and it ends up with with uh, the the dotted end over here. And again, the dotted end appears here, and the arrow end appears here. So what's happening is this arrow is being flipped. It's like a mirror image of. So this area here. The mirror image representation is on V2, and V2, the mirror image of it, is on V3. 
So what the brain is trying to do is keep near cells near each other. Um, and it does so by actually pulling it, does, by keeping these near cells near each other, it actually reduces the connections between the different areas. So for example, here's V1 in the depths of the calcrine, and this is our line going from the, the depths of the calcrine to the V1, V2 border. And then the, the arrow is flipped and represented the opposite way in V2. Well, these are the connections you would have to make from V1 to V2 to represent that area. Okay? And you can imagine this is an axon. And during the evolution of the brain in the fetus, if this were to act like a spring, it would pull these two folds close to each other and as a consequence reduce the length of this axon. So it's thought that these folds are produced in order to shorten the connections and by having these mirror image representations we have very short connections. Okay, what's happening in these higher order areas? So you you can see, imagine that V1 was seeing these lines, okay? These lines of different orientations. And different cells light up. Uh, one that's interested in this vertical line here. Another one in a different column interested in this vertical line here. And then other columns light up for these horizontal lines. And then um, still another column for this one isolated line. But how does the brain sort of maybe combine these four lines into a box and leave this fifth line separate? Okay. So one theory is, is the following. Oops. That, okay, you've got five cells, V1 cells, each representing a different line. They're these simple cells, they weren't tuned for those particular orientations and locations. And when you see the, the four lines as separate items, they all fire at different times. But when something figures out that four lines belong to the, a box, those four cells, A, B, and C, D, start firing together. Okay. And how do they start firing together? Well, it's thought some sort of binding occurs up in higher areas. Um, and this binding uh, feeds back to lower areas and eventually to V1. Um, and they cause all the cells con connected uh, to fire together. And that produces a larger activity. Now this binding occurs um, rather simply for that box, but let's suppose one, one look, looks at this. You see different shapes here, and if you group them together in different ways, you find that you see things. You might see a giraffe's head here, and if you look carefully, you might see another giraffe's head here. And then here, you bind these blobs and these blobs and see two necks. Okay, so your brain is, is combining these things, these objects, into, or these, these blobs, into objects. And if you segregate them by color, you can see these things more clearly. In fact, I, I was having trouble. I was binding the wrong blobs into the neck of this giraffe. In fact, it's these blobs that form the neck and body of the giraffe. The interesting thing is once you've seen this and you turn the color off, your mind can, can keep this binding intact. In, in um, so this is the memory that's predicting what you should be seeing. So the output from the cortex to the visual system or deeper areas of the cor cortex to these early areas 
are influencing what you see. Here's another example. You can see here the, uh, uh, the, these, these uh, corners of the circle, and they're rotating. Okay. Occasionally, they rotate in such a way that you see a square here. Look, wait for the moment which you see a square here. Okay. And if you, when you see a square here, which will be easier here, because the lines are are not rotating as much. Whoops, they still are. <laughs> okay. When when you when you you see the image of a square, you'll see the impression of a line between this end of this line and that line. It's sort of, and that's because you have these um, cells that, that, that sort of combine these two ends together in these higher areas. Here, here it's uh, more clear because it stopped rotating. So you can see this line appearing across here, down here, down here. And this is your brain making this, this up again. And then if you sort of look at it for a longer time, this middle area will start appearing greenish, where in fact there's no green color there. And this is all sort of a, an illusion being built up by, by your higher order areas. So you have your visual image, your visual cortex, and it goes to higher areas. And they then um, get influenced by memories. And based on these memories, you make an interpretation of what, what you think you're seeing. And that then influences the visual cortex itself, the early visual areas. And e examples of that is, is when you see um, uh, things like this, this word being misspelled. You expect the word to be, this N to be an M here. And so you, you don't notice it, that it's misspelled because of the influence. Woo, better watch out. And if you l try reading this, you'll find it's possible to read that. And the reason is because often the brain, all it needs is the first and the last letter of each word. And it can make up what the middle portions are itself. So your eye jumps from word to word. Your brain notices the first and the last letter, thinks it recognizes the word, even though it, you know, the middle letters are all wrong. Okay, so how does this happen? Where does the information go? So from V1, it goes to V2, then to V3. And then it goes along two pathways. One heads up here along the top of the brain to the parietal lobe. And that pathway is called the wear stream. The other pathway goes down here uh, to the inferior temporal lobe along the bottom of the brain. This here is the back of the brain, the posterior. This here is the front of the brain. Okay, this is the dorsal or top. This is the ventral or bottom. Now, in these regions, it's like going out to a uh, um, Masonville and going to the Silver City and seeing all these a dozen theaters. Okay, but in, your, in the case of your brain, it had several dozen theaters. And they're all playing, uh, uh, like like the Silver City. They're all playing a movie, except in your head, it's the same movie. All these screens, these dozens of screens, are playing the same movie, except the movies are, it's the same movie, but they're different parts of it are being sent or processed by different areas. In some, it's just the color that's being processed. In some, it's just what's moving is being processed. And in many other areas that, that we're still t uh, trying to discover what is being processed. Now, these two pathways, the one is the dorsal, uh, that's along the top, and it's concerned with selecting 
actions to act on, a, on, 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 on certain locations. So, for example, when I direct my hand to my mouse, that's a, an action that this part of the brain is, is involved with. And so that's called the where strip. We're interested where the mouse is and where I should direct my hand to. Now we'll look at it more, in more detail in, in, in the session five. Today we're going to concentrate on this ventral strip, the one that goes along the bottom surface of the cortex to the inferior temporal lobe. And it's, this is involved with perception and recognition of objects such as faces. So it's concerned with what things are. Now, you can see that an object begins in V1 and you extract simple things in V1 and ends in the inferior temporal lobe where you see uh, very complex um, objects but a particular combination of features such as faces. Now, what's interesting in, is that in v, you send a signal to v, from V1 to V2 and V2 to V3, but here, if there's an object that we're looking at, the, the top part of the object and the bottom part of the object are being processed by quite separate cells, okay? These cells are different parts of the brain. Now, we start putting things together in a place called LOC, the lateral occipital complex, located here on the side of the brain, uh, but still towards the back. And here um, we can tell things are, we combine the upper and lower visual fields. So if this line here appears in the upper or lower part, part of the, the LOC, it'll still be recognized but not yet the left and right side. So this one here is looking at things that appear in the left visual field. It's the right side of the brain. And the opposite <laughs> LOC will be looking at seeing objects on the, this, the right visual field. Now in V1, we, start, we looked at things like uh, lines in the spokes and color in the blobs. These are features. And then what happens is that it, in places like LOC, we start combining these features into parts of object. You can see that initially here, there might be a line that's, that's crossing these simple cells. Well, all these simple cells then uh, send their signals to V2, V3, and LOC. And the edges are then combined and you start seeing the, the, sh the shape that's represented. So part of an object. And finally, we go to a place, like we'll see in a moment, the fusiform face area in IT, where you recognize faces. And he, in here, in the fusiform face area, it doesn't matter whether the object, the face is on the right, the left, the top, the bottom, anywhere that face is represented because fusiform various area can see things from every, uh, from all the visual fields. Now, if you have lesions of the, um, um, of the LOC um, on both sides, You'll have the fail. You'll 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 be unable to recognize any object. So if you looked at this this thing, uh, you could tell that it's gray and it has a round top, but you won't recognize it as a mouse. Um, this, the same thing. You won't be able to recognize faces. Uh, no objects. Um, if you have then lesions over here you start being unable to recognize particular objects. So whereas all objects are represented here, 
particular objects are being represented in different parts of the inferior temporal lobe. So somewhere there's a, a right, if you have a lesion, you won't be able to recognize rhinoceri. Okay, so what's the evidence for uh, uh, these two streams? Well, one of the f famous experiment was done by uh, Ungleiter and Hexbury, and they asked subjects two questions. So what they did was put, put subjects in these uh, MRI machines, but the, um, the machines were able to measure the blood flow and from that uh, determine which, and, and based on, on the polarization of this blood, the, 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 they were able to detect how much oxygen was in that blood flow. And from that, they can determine how active different parts of the brain were. And when they had this subject in that magnet, they asked them one of two simple questions. Is the same face uh, that we, you see now the one you just saw a second ago? Okay. So it's the same. Con we concentrate on the face. And I'd like you all to do that. Okay. So hit the... the Make a noise with the, with the on your on your table when the, the the face you're looking at now is the same face you saw just before. Okay, so if you those that did that were lighting up areas down here in your temporal lobe. Okay, now let's ask the same question <laughs> and I'll present the same stimuli, but now the, or not, I won't ask the same question, I'll ask a new question. Is this face in the same location? Okay, so notice there's a subtle difference, it's not the same face, you, you, it's this, you're now concentrating on location. Good. So, and now when you did that, contrary on location, the same stimuli lit up a completely different part of your cortex, this, this upper part of your cortex, along your parietal lobe. So, again, uh, if, uh, if this, you have these two different pathways, you could imagine that uh, if you lesion one or the other, you'd have different symptoms. <coughs> so if we lesion this, yes indeed, we have a patient who has difficulty in grasping something like a computer mouse. I, I, can, I, know, I can look at it and uh, see and recognize that it's a computer mouse, but I have difficulty grasping it. I, I can't get to the right location or when I get to the right, right location, I then can't move it around properly. And I can't orient my hand in the correct direction. Now, in contrast, when I have a lesion here, like LOC, I can't recognize that this is a mouse, but I can still reach for it quite accurately. Now, Nancy Kenwisher, and, and on your uh, sort of things to see as well, there's a nice recording of her giving a speech on her, on her findings. She discovered that down here, there's a place called the fusiform face area. And all the neurons there light up preferentially to faces. And a particular face will light up a small cluster of very selective neurons. So all the faces in this, all the neurons in this small cluster will light up for this particular face. And probably the same sort of thing holds for not just faces, but all other kinds of objects as well throughout the inferior temporal lobe. 
Now, if you lose this fusiform phase area, you have something called prosopagnosia. So the patient with a prosopagnosia can recognize even someone like a friend okay, from visual cues. Um, but you can still recognize it from other cues, like the voice, the person's gait. Um, and the amazing thing is that um, uh, you, can, you can't even rec uh, you recognize, imagine if you couldn't recognize uh, your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your wife or um, you went to Loblaws and you separated and then you came back and, and, and met, got together. Uh, you're both there at the checkout counter, but you look and you're the one with the lesion at the sea of people and you can't tell which one is your wife or a girlfriend or boyfriend, you know. It's, it, it, you wouldn't be able to recognize them visually. It's hard to imagine, but uh, that's what, 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 what ha would happen to you. And again, there's an interesting video of someone uh, being interviewed that has this problem. And this person is a photographer and largely taking pictures of people's faces. Okay, um, so areas in the inferior temporal lobe, including uh, a fusiform face area, uh, the cells respond selectively to particular classes of objects, such as faces, hands, or arms. So this one here um, is not sensitive to a rhino, but is sensitive to a lion, and is not sensitive to a giraffe. Now, uh, so there are cells that res respond to hand but not to faces, um, and they're always to a particular object. Now, the other interesting thing is that uh, in, the, in this inferior temporal lobe, um, the object, the face, can appear anywhere. So these, these cells have a huge receptive field, okay? The receptive field of some cells is, uh, especially in V1, are always contralateral. Um, and if it's above the calcarine, they're, they're in a certain place. If it's above the calcarine, below or above the calcarine, again, the different cells. Whereas here, it's anywhere in the, in the, in the visual fields. So the receptive fields are huge. Uh, it doesn't matter also what the size of the object is. It can be big or small. And it doesn't matter how the object is represented. So, for example, the, the object could be just uh, an outline. You still recognize it as a lion. You can define it by its color. <coughs> the color of the, the lion is different from the background. <coughs> or its texture, or motion. Now, if you watch this, these lines here, when they stop, the lion blends into the background. Then it starts up again. You can see the lion. Then it stops. It blends into its background. So the motion is necessary to figure out which lines <coughs> belong to the lion and which lines belong to the background. Now. Some images that look somewhat, somewhat similar are, are light up very different cells in IT. So in V1, this area here, for cells in V1, in this part of V1, will light up for this object and this object, very similar cells. But they'll light up different cells in IT. In contrast, um, Images that look very different in V1 uh, might up led up uh, lighting up the very same cells in IT because they're on different parts of the retina and represented by different um, cues. One is by color, and the other is by lines. The other thing is is, is, is striking is how rapidly we recognize uh, objects. You know. 
uh, we recognize uh, that this is a bomb in, in, in less than 100 milliseconds, okay? And it, it, that's remarkable it takes, because it takes something like, like 50 milliseconds just to get into the visual cortex, you know? And after that, it goes through the, through, through the rest of the cortex and comes back with the answer. Yes, it's Obama. And um, we can recognize it's Obama not only by, by in, 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 in that one picture, but in all these pictures, we, we have a sort of an impression of what Obama looks like from a at a variety of ages and at a variety of viewpoints. Now, so in this uh, IT, again, we have this columnar organization, but each column of neurons represents different things. Uh, adjacent columns over here represent different viewpoints. Adjacent columns over here, um, again, somewhat similar, but this, these uh, things that look like, might look like characters being represented. Again, this is different viewpoints of the same face. This, these are different impressions of what uh, a Y or T or an arrow could be. I keep hitting those things. Got to turn them off. Okay, we look at objects like faces with our fovea. Okay, so here we're looking at an object with our fovea. When we looked at, at a picture, we can we 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 don't notice that we're all we see is these individual objects. But if you look at the faces around you, that's that that's what your eye is doing, and it somehow puts together and sees this instead. Okay, not the individual images that the, your fovea saw, but the whole image together. The other interesting thing it does is produce visual illusions. Now, here you have, oops, two lines. I've got to turn it off. I'm going to re reduce the length of the line closer to us. And you tell me, hit the table as hard as you can, when these two lines are of the same length. Okay, well, down it goes. Okay, but they're not. Okay, why is that? Okay, well, it's a property of your uh, watt stream, which is interested, interested not, not in the fact that the, these are two lines of a particular length, but that this is a window, okay, and of course a window is rectangular in shape, and those two lines in a window are of the same length, and so your your your, your watt stream is distorting what you see because you you recognize things as objects. Now. One of the problems with that is that if you're an artist, you have to learn to draw not what you see with your what stream, but what their actual lengths are visually. Okay? So you can't be distracted by this distortion of the what stream. And that's why uh, to be able to, to draw a scene like you see there takes considerable practice. It's not something that's inherent to you. You have to sort of unlearn what your watt stream had distorts. The other thing about the watt stream is you see anything odd with this, this what is probably Mona Lisa. Okay? When it's upright, you notice that the lips are wrong and the eyes are wrong. Okay? But you don't notice it when it's upside down. Why is that the case? Well, 
somewhere in, in your cortex, you're storing, storing this picture of bodilies as you store the pictures of everyone that you've met and recognized. And you store these pictures in sort of a, a canonical view that you've seen this person most often in. Okay. And usually that's from the front. And so you store it where this is up, this is down, left, right. And so when you see it in the same view, it's easier to compare what you're seeing to what your memory of that person is. Whereas if the person is upside down, you've got to transform that eye from what you see to what you remember it to be. Okay. And perhaps we haven't practiced that enough and therefore are less able to recognize that there's something odd with these eyes. Okay, we're almost done. So, we saw that the, the visual stream uh, divides into two directions. One is a wear stream over here at the top of the, the cortex, um, dev devoted to actions, and a what stream that goes underneath the cortex, um, dealing with objects and uh, faces, and in fact we'll learn later uh, things like words. <coughs> so the what stream gets a, its primary input from the fovea, okay, because that's where you see things in detail. The where stream is gets a lot of information its information from the periphery. I see this mouse in the, my peripheral vision and then look at it or then reach for it. Now, in, 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 in session five, uh, we'll, we'll learn that these two sides aren't equal. Um, the, the one side of the brain doesn't represent uh, things that the other side of the brain does. The left side uh, uh, represents language, and the right side most, mostly spatial f features. Um, so that's probably why it's so difficult to, to associate a name with a face. The face is on one side and the, the name of it on the other. 